Welcome back everybody, my name's Pete Swinney and this is a supplement webinar to our previous Boost Control Setup Closed Loop webinar. It would be useful to have viewed all of our Boost Control webinars prior to viewing this one. Helpful hints on Boost Control Plumbing, Boost Control Setup Part 1, open loop, POD parameters explained, and most definitely boost control setup part two, closed loop. You can find these webinars on our website under the webinar archive. Okay, so re kind of resuming from the part of the boost control closed loop webinar where we're preparing the setup in the ECU for the closed loop uh, side of control. So you'll recognize this screen from the previous webinar, which hopefully you've just watched. The part we're going to talk about today is really the, the most of it is about the normal position table. This is a really vital table uh, to have accurate. It is the beginning of the PID calculation or the closed loop uh, algorithm that the ECU performs is done using this number, the normal position number, as the beginning of the calculation. So for any given um, boost error or any position where the, that the RPM and boost are at, the ECU is constantly performing calculations to decide what duty to run on the uh, on the duty cycle solenoid for the boost control. So it will look at the normal position table for the RPM and whatever axis you have here on the vertical side and it'll look to see what to start the calculation with, what duty cycle. So the normal uh, procedure as from the last webinar, we would take the duty cycles from our aim boost from when we were doing our testing in open loop control. If you remember, in open loop control, all, all tables in the boost control setup are basically set to zero, and the ECU just uses the duty cycles that are entered in the aim boost table. So we, set, we put different duty cycles in at different uh, areas to get different amounts of boost. And through tuning and testing, we can come up with a boost curve or a, you know, different levels of boost which are dependent on the RPM in this case and the throttle position. So each, each level of RPM and each level of throttle position we are having slightly different duty cycle numbers applied to the solenoid that is controlling the boost. So if we were to base, basically switch from this style of uh, control which is open loop into closed loop we would substitute all the numbers from the aim boost table, the duty cycle numbers, into the boost normal position table. And so in this case you'll see we've transferred those numbers down to here. So that might in the real world uh, translate to a specific boost that the customer has set it up to be. It may be one bar of boost which is 200 kPa absolute and the engine may run exactly that all the way up the RPM, just requiring different duty cycle numbers to obtain exactly that boost level. And in this case, it might drop down to 10 pound at 20% duty cycle. So that set boost curve for this particular engine can be mimicked as a starting point by putting all the duty cycle numbers down into the boost normal position table. Again, just to repeat that, the ECU then starts the calculation using this number. So if the, if the customer or driver is at full throttle at 4,000 revs, the ECU immediately goes to 76% duty on the solenoid and because we know from testing that that's approximately uh, the boost that we're after. And then it does the PID calculations on trying to eliminate the error if it's not running 200 kPa that was the aim. Now that works quite well unless the tuner decides he wants to now run 250 kPa here. So up the top of the aim boost uh, table he may choose to change it from 
as I say, 200 to 250. Now, the aim boost table, of course, now has manifold pressure numbers in it. So that's manifold pressure in absolute KPA. So these are the numbers that appear in ECU manager while you're tuning on the, on the fuel screen and, and it is the genuine manifold absolute pressure. So in this case here, the aim boost table has been filled out and the customer we can see in this example is after 2.2 bar of boost, 220 kPa at 6,500 RPM and at full throttle. And as I said previously, that may be the correct duty to run that boost. So at say at 6,000 revs, it required 88% duty. Oops, wrong way. 88% duty to make 220 kPa. Now that system as it stands now would work fine except for when we go to change the numbers here. That, that aim duty number is then not appropriate. It would need to be different. If we wanted, if we change this to be 250 kPa now, the aim duty up here now needs to be higher. So rather than re-measure it again and put what we think is the correct number there, we, we form the boost normal position table in a different way. Okay, so just to refresh here, this is the aim boost table. You're now in closed loop, so you fill out the, the actual boost you want to run in absolute pressure, manifold pressure, absolute manifold pressure. Okay, but now we want to run this thing in like a true closed loop and we want to now use the normal position table in a different way. We're actually going to put the boost aim channel as the vertical axis on the normal position table. So this is the uh, boost aim channel that's the result of our actual aim boost table. All these tables and channels are, can be confusing. So if I just go back, our aim boost table, which is this one, this becomes a channel, like a result channel. So this aim boost table, if we were 4,500 RPM and 100% throttle, would be 180. If we backed off to 40% throttle at 4,500 revs, the aim boost would be 140. So what we're doing is we're taking this aim boost value and moving it to the vertical axis of the boost normal position table. So now we need to put in numbers that represent or are our best guess at the duty cycle required to make each of these boost levels. And where do we get these numbers from? Well, we go back to our testing, which we did when we were in open loop boost control. Uh, two, two webinars ago on the boost control side, I would have had you testing to see what duty made what boost. Now here's an example of some notes that uh, we may have made. So we potentially on an engine dyno could hold the RPM at 3000 revs and at full throttle and type in some varying duty cycles to see what boost we make at each duty cycle and we can record that. Now you could update these figures here based on some testing that, you, that you've done after setting up the open loop boost control. So we could review and maybe change some of these figures and work out in, in real life, on the racetrack, on the water, wherever you're testing, if we're at 3000 revs, what, it, what is the duty that makes 220 kPa? All right, 5,000 revs, what is the duty that makes 220 kPa? See, it's different. So we have this, this set of notes, this information, and we take that information and we put it into our boost normal position table. So here's our boost normal position table. It is the boost aim channel. And now we can go at 220 kPa at 3,000 revs, 61% duty is what's required on the solenoid to make that boost at that RPM. So we fill out that table and if we make a really good job of that, it means that the PID control doesn't have to work as hard. Basically, when the engine gets to each of these levels 
and the boost is uh, aim is set uh, by the aim table. The aim table and maybe 240 kPa. If we go to 240 kPa aim and we're at three and a half thousand revs, our previous testing has told us that a number of 67 is what we need to get it very, very close to that. Then the PID only has to trim a, a, a very small amount to get it exactly on our, our aim. Okay. So once we've got that filled out accurately, we can then fill out a little bit differently from our last webinar, the minimum and maximum duty cycle tables. And again, these tables, uh, like the normal position table, will require the boost aim channel to be put on their vertical axis. And just a reminder how to do that, a shortcut to changing the setup of any table is to type the letter A. A will bring up the axis setup. Once you're in the axis setup, you can choose the boost aim channel just by starting to type, type boost and aim. And then once that channel is on there, you can simply add the sites that you want. Now, obviously, there's no point in adding uh, down the bottom of the axis 20 kPa, 40 kPa, 60 kPa. That, they're not uh, numbers that, that you're interested in running in boost. I mean, they're not even boost numbers. So uh, often even people won't even put it in 100 kPa. So uh, get the axis set up in an appropriate manner to suit the amount of boost you're running. If you're running 350 to 400 kPa, well, you need to make the numbers go that high on all tables. So this is the boost minimum table. And at each level of boost, as ex again, example, 240 kPa, 4,000 revs. We have a number of 43. Now, from memory, if we go back, 4,000 revs, our normal position at 240 kPa, normal position 68. So we're now typing in a number much lower than that to allow the solenoid duty cycle to come down if for any reason the boost is, is too high. All right, and then we, uh, sorry, that's the minimum duty there. I was on the maximum, 240 kPa, 4,000. So there we have a, a number of 43. Now, our maximum number, 240 kPa and 4,000 revs, here you'll see we've entered it 73 as being the maximum, and that's very close to, or initially we want it quite close to what we believe the, the normal position duty cycle is going to be, or the normal position, our predicted perfect duty cycle to run 240 kPa at 4,000. The reason we want to keep it quite close is that if while you're getting the PID or the control algorithm sorted out, if if that's running out of control and the, and the boost is surging up and down, we don't want that number to get too high and therefore over boost the engine. So we keep the maximum boost number only a little bit above the normal position. So if I go back and check my normal position number for there, it was 68 and normal position for, and sorry, our maximum duty is a, a, only five numbers above at 73. Okay, so here's a, a slide with all three tables on it so you can see the relationship between them all. So we have 4,000 RPM, 240 kPa, 68, minimum number at 4,000 RPM, 240, 43, and maximum number, just having to line it all up here for you, 73. So, a nice tight relationship around the, what the boost normal position is. What that looks like if, uh, when we look at it as a series of lines, which is much easier if you ask me, the minimum duty is well under what we believe the correct duty to be, the normal position duty, allowing the computer to lower the boost if need be. It's a safety thing. And the maximum number quite close to the normal position number. The maximum number, uh, or the max duty, we're leaving nice and tight there, just in case we have an overboost situation where the computer's getting the numbers wrong due to a, a bad PID control setting. We will need to move the maximum duty number further up once we get the PID under control. The reason you need to do that is when the boost is uh, climbing and you want the, the duty cycle may need to rise just for a moment 
well above the normal position to get the boost to start to uh, increase rapidly. And then hopefully if everything is, uh, is, is designed well and your normal position is accurate, then the boost will, or the duty will fall back down to around the normal position number. So the more, the tighter you clamp the max duty, what that means is it, it gives the control algorithm less room to move if there is an issue. So maybe the turbo gets a little sad and the bearings get, get a bit worn out and it's not as efficient. So quite often it may need a higher number, a higher normal position number um, to, to run the boost that you want. So um, just be aware that that max duty is not, not necessarily perfectly positioned when it's tight around the normal position. All right, so just as another final uh, test and tune procedure, we went over it in the last webinar, but it's really important to quickly discuss it again. Double check precautions. And it's just so important to make sure that this thing is set up safely if and when it does happen to overboost. PID closed loop algorithms are not easy to deal with, uh, so we want to have as much safety as possible. In the ECU setup for the boost control, there is an overboost cut. So if it's going to get anywhere near too high, we can have a total fuel cut by entering the correct overboost number. If you're aiming for 300 kPa and you really don't want it going above 320, then at 325, put in a full boost cut. Map sensor default. If you've got a three bar map sensor, for example, and you're running just under three bar maximum boost, if that ever runs over the three bar, the sensor will go into default. So we need that default reading that the ECU uses when the sensor is in default or an error. We need that to be a safe number. So a typical number for a three bar map sensor would be to use 300 kPa or even higher, 320 kPa. So just to understand, when the sensor goes into error, the ECU uses a sub the substitute value. We might as well have the substitute value being a nice, safe, rich number. A disaster would be to use a number of 100. That would effectively lean the engine out when the boost went higher than 300 kPa, which would not be good. The other thing we want to do is, in, in the ignition and the fuel tables, we want safe numbers in those tables when and if it does over boost. So as the uh, fuel table numbers go up in KPA or up in boost, we want larger fuel numbers there. Uh, who cares if it runs stupid rich and blows black smoke when it's over boosting as long as it's safe. Same thing with ignition. As it gets higher in boost, we need the ignition numbers to fall away as well. A good rule of thumb there is about 2 to 3 degrees per 20 KPA. All right, so Plenty of ignition coming out. We want to enter the recommended numbers into the PID tables. Those numbers I gave you last webinar were something like the P of 0.3 and the I of 0 and the D at around 0 0.03. We want to keep those numbers, especially the P and D, uh, in a similar relationship to one another. If the P number goes up by double, then the D number would go up by around double. So uh, you work with those two numbers kind of together at similar relationships just to get the thing so that it's starting to work in a closed loop fashion. Now just remember that PID is explained in a separate webinar that you can review, review on. It's not an easy subject, so don't be frustrated if you're struggling to get it right to start with. So we want to uh, initially work on just the P and the D. The I is there to eliminate small minor errors. Now when it comes to boost control, a half pound error initially while you get the boost control working is uh, not so important. So get the P and D numbers working well first and then creep up the I to fix any small errors that might occur. So initially we go out for our testing on our preset numbers and we just do a very quick small test. Don't go out for, for uh, 20 seconds of full throttle and just hope that it'll work, otherwise you might come back with an overheated engine or any, anything could happen. So um, small tests, look at the logging and uh, creep up on it. 
you can conduct step tests once you've got some numbers uh, in the ballpark of uh, some, some sort of decent uh, control happening. And this is the way to, to test how good the actual control is working. So we go into the aim boost table and if we're on an engine dyno for instance, we ask for say 200 kPa in the aim boost and then ask for say 220 or 230 and then step down from 230 to 200 and watch and log how the boost follows the aim request. So go up and down from 200 to 230, then down to 180, and then just see how the boost is going up and down as you ask for different levels. And by especially by logging the duty cycle of the solenoid, logging the manifold pressure, and logging the aim boost value, you'll be able to see how each thing is reacting to the other. So you want to see the, the solenoid duty cycle behaving in a, as reason, a reasonably non-erratic manner. If it's, if it's bouncing up and down from its maximum to its minimum, and it sounds like initially anyway you've got too much proportional gain. So you can gut those step tests and if you're in something like a jet ski or a single seater boat or a single seater car where you can't be on the laptop while you're testing, you can use a full throttle timer and program step tests into that. So for instance, at two seconds of full throttle, you ask for 220 kPa, then ask for 180 kPa two seconds later, then ask for 230 kPa two seconds later again. And you can log all that happening and be nice and conservative on the ignition and the fuel, just wanting to get the actual boost to follow the request. So initially start with low P numbers, low D numbers, and gradually beef up the P enough to get a good enough response to the request. Once that's done, then manipulate the D around to kind of stop hunting and um, get it so it's operating in a reasonable fashion without too much hunt. And then use the I at the end of it all to eliminate any minor errors. Keep the numbers as low as you can to achieve the uh, minimum required response for what you're doing. Okay, after you've got that happening, and, and maybe towards the end of that process, you may need to move out the max duty numbers to allow that solenoid to move quick, high enough, quickly enough to get the boost lifting at a speed that you're after. It's not easy, I'm the first to admit, but uh, if you follow these uh, simple steps, especially the, the plumbing and the open loop testing where you get good duty cycle numbers that are normal for each boost level. That really is a key to making this work well. All right, so thanks for tuning in. Another webinar, or many other webinars are available on our website at, at the uh, address that you can see here. And um, yeah, we'll catch you next time.